everybody. Welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. This is Nurse Mo, and I am so jazzed that you are here with me today. And today we're going to be talking about the very exciting topic of drum roll, drum roll, drum roll, hyponatremia. And if you're thinking, oh, electrolyte imbalance, boring. Well, it's not. It's really interesting, mainly because it has so much to do with the brain, and the brain is fascinating to me. Before we get into that, I just want to take care of a little housekeeping, mainly that if you are listening to this podcast and you like it, and it's helping you, and you don't mind that it's totally low budget, and I don't really know what I'm doing when it comes to recording and editing and all of that fancy stuff. Um, but if it's the content that you like and that helps you, please go to your place where you get your podcast, whether it's iTunes or Google Play or Stitcher, and leave us a little review. That would be amazing. I know there's a ton of you downloading and listening to the podcast because I've got the stats to prove it. So I'm totally spying on you. Not really. I just have the numbers. But I know there's thousands of you and it would be fantastic if a bunch of you rated and reviewed. I would consider that a huge payback for the time and effort that goes into all this. So please do that. It would just make my day and it is my birthday month. So maybe that could be your birthday month gift to me. Okay. So hyponatremia. One of the things that I always think about when I think about hyponatremia, and you might have heard about this in the news a few years ago, I don't really know how many years ago it was, probably more than a few, but there was this local radio station that had a contest, and this was when the Wii game console first came out, so how long ago was that? I don't even know, but um, the contest was titled, Hold Your Wii for a Wii. So basically hold your urine and win a Wii game console. So the basic premise of this ridiculous, dangerous contest was that the contestants, and I don't know if there were three or four of them, something like that, small group, were to come on to the air, it was on the morning show, and drink a bunch of water And whoever could hold their urine the longest won the Wii game console. So as soon as the community at large heard about this upcoming contest, the radio station, from what I understand, was inundated with phone calls from doctors and nurses saying, "Um, this is extremely dangerous, don't do it, people could die, and this was completely ignored. So I'm... I'm thinking, I mean, I don't know what people think when they're being absolutely um, ignorant and ignoring a lot of solid advice, but they were probably thinking, it's water. What's the big deal? It's harmless. It's water. Nobody got hurt from drinking water. Well, guess what? People get hurt all the time from drinking too much water. So what happened, and it's very tragic and very sad, was that the woman who won, and I I can't remember if she was trying to win it for her kids, like a graduation gift or a birthday gift or a Christmas gift. I think she was trying to win this thing for her kids. She went home from the contest, didn't feel well, laid down, never, never woke up. So the whole thing was avoidable, tragic, sad beyond comprehension and I do believe that the uh, people on the radio program that came up with the contest and ignored all the frantic phone calls from the physicians and the nurses in the community ended up losing their jobs and probably a lot more than that so anyway my point is hyponatremia super serious but you are an awesome nursing student or nurse and you are going to know exactly what to do when your patient has hyponatremia. So what is hyponatremia anyway? It's basically a sodium level below 135, technically, because remember the standard sodium normal range is 135 to 145. 
But you're not going to get crazy nervous about your patient's sodium level until it gets down maybe into the 120s. That's when you, I mean, if they they come in, their sodium is 134, you know, big whoop. But if they come in and their sodium is 121, that might be a little bit strange. Though I have had a patient whose sodium was in the lowish 120s and he was mentating just fine. And what we surmised from that was that he had chronic hyponatremia and his body had slowly somehow adapted to this incompatible with life level of sodium. But anyway, for the most part, acute onset hyponatremia, starting to get into the 120s, you're getting nervous below that, you're, you're going to see symptoms most likely that are pretty severe. So what signs and symptoms do you see with hyponatremia? So to understand the types of signs and symptoms that you see, let's think back a little bit and pull up all that amazing knowledge that you obtained in your anatomy and physiology class and the concept of osmosis. So think about the blood traveling through the body, blood that is low on sodium. It's going to be kind of dilute, right? When I say blood, I mean like the fluid traveling through your body. Um, it's going to be dilute because it doesn't have quite the concentration of electrolytes, namely sodium, that it should. So it's going to travel around in the bloodstream, including up into the brain. And osmosis is going to cause water to move from outside the cell into the brain cells to help equalize the concentration between those two fluid compartments essentially. So basically hyponatremia, blood, blood, good night, water is going to move from outside the cell into the brain cell causing the brain cells to swell which is cerebral edema which is why most if not all of the symptoms well, probably, I mean, maybe there's a handful that aren't neurologically based, but I'm going to say most, if not all, of the signs and symptoms of hyponatremia are going to be neurological. So those, the big ones are nausea, vomiting, seizures can occur, lethargy and somnolence is probably um, the most universal confusion and headache. So, you know, it probably kind of starts with a headache and this nausea, vomiting, leads to lethargy, somnolence, seizures, and even death. So let's talk about what causes it in the first place. Well, one of the most common that you'll see is, like in our example of the very unfortunate woman who participated in the We Console contest on the radio is water intoxication. Most people don't suffer from water intoxication just out and about in their everyday lives um, because your body is smart, right? And it regulates the amount of water you drink via uh, a thirst mechanism that in most people works just fabulously. But let's say your patient has a tumor or a psych disorder, then they can get water intoxication from that. And I think back a lot, there was this really funny, I don't know what TV show it was. Was it Grey's Anatomy or Scrubs? It was one of those medical shows. And there was a patient with a brain tumor on the show. And the nurses had to keep taking all the water away from him and he ended up drinking out of the toilet. Well, with a patient like this, their thirst mechanism is always turned on. Always, always, always. I want to say Gilbert Gottfried played the patient. It was somebody really funny. Um, but the thirst mechanism is turned on all the time, and you just don't feel like you're getting enough to drink. So you get this water intoxication. And then somewhat recently, I was working in a trauma unit, and the patient had some kind of brain injury. And it wasn't my patient, but he was on severe pretty severe fluid restriction, but constantly felt thirsty because of this neuro injury that he had and somehow was getting out of bed, which is really hard for me to picture because the nursing, like the nursing unit, uh, the 
you know, the nursing station right there. It was all right there. The rooms were just right around the nursing station. There were always people around, but it was the middle of the night, whatever. Um, he was able to get out of bed and walk over to the sink in the room without coming off any of the monitor leads, and he was drinking out of the sink. And then they eventually had to call um, the plant ops guy and have him come turn off the water to that room. So anyway, you'll often see people drinking way too much because of neurological injury. You can also drink way too much because you have poor judgment. There was a patient years and years and years ago who had to take a urine test for some reason. I don't even remember why, but had to take a urine test and was nervous about it. Like they had to have this urine test. I don't know if it was a, for a job or, you know, how you have to go and, and get drug tested for a job. It was something where you had to do it, had to happen. And she got really nervous about, well, what if I can't, what if I can't perform when the, you know, I'm under the gun? And, and she was really nervous about that. So what did she do? She drank like some ridiculous amount of water like five gallons or something. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Ended up with hyponatremia and severe brain injury. So don't drink five gallons of water, people. And don't go on the radio and try to win a game console because you've drunk too much water and are not urinating. Anyway, so you can also get hyponatremia from um, SIADH which also is Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone. This is worthy of an entire podcast on its own. It's super interesting. But the short version is that there are um, certain neurological conditions can cause SIADH. And when this happens, the body is going to circulate, circulate, produce too much ADH, too much of the antidiuretic, which causes water retention and therefore hyponatremia. It can also be caused by medications and namely street drugs like ecstasy. So um, you can also get hyponatremia, not necessarily related to too much water consumption or hypervolemia, but it can also be due to sodium losses when your patient is severely vomiting, having severe diarrhea for a while, maybe a few days. But for the most part, what I typically see in the hospital is a hyponatremia due to the dilutional effect of water, either a some kind of a tumor or SIADH or um, people just being not that bright. Okay, so how are we going to treat hyponatremia? Let's um, assume for the purposes of this discussion, that the underlying cause for the hyponatremia is being addressed as well. So if the patient has a brain tumor, that is going to be addressed, you know, a medication that they're taking, that's being addressed. So if you're, your mild hyponatremia treatment, well, let me back up just a little bit. Let's say your patient has hyponatremia and it's due to a brain tumor. Okay, you're going to obviously fix the brain tumor and that is you know, over time going to correct the hyponatremia as the brain tumor goes away. But in the acute phase, you need to correct the sodium as well, okay? So you're not going to ignore the underlying cause and just treat the sodium level. You will treat the underlying cause while you're treating the sodium level, okay? I hope that makes sense. So let's say we have mild hyponatremia. They're not necessarily symptomatic, but their sodium is on the low side. So you could give a diuretic, like Lasix or furosemide, if you want to be fancy, and put the patient on water restriction. That's the first line of treatment, water restriction and diuresis. Patients hate water restriction. They hate it, hate it, hate it. Okay, so the ironic thing about water restriction is that I think if you didn't tell the patient they were on water restriction, they wouldn't notice. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they would. But unless they have one of those tumors or things that makes their thirst mechanism stay on all the time, Patients could probably be on water restriction without too much discomfort. If they do have that thirst mechanism issue, then they are really going to have a hard, hard time with water restriction. Uh, patients will try to manipulate you into bringing them more water, trick you, 
um, and to bring in them water, ask everyone who walks by the room to bring them water. And typically, oh, I'll bring your patient a cup of water, no big deal. That's why, you know, if you're helping the ho at the hospital, you're a clinical, you're a volunteer, if a patient asks you for a cup of water, always ask the nurse, can I get so-and-so some water? A, they could just be NPO. People will ask you for things when they're NPO and they know they're supposed to not have anything. And B, they could be on a water restriction of some kind. So those are the two things that you would do for mild hyponatremia. If you start having neurological symptoms and any cerebral edema, you know, we're going to consider that like a moderate to severe hyponatremia depending on the severity of the symptoms and the severity of the cerebral edema. And we got to get a little fancy, okay? So we're going to pull out hypertonic fluids from our bag of tricks. So what is a hypertonic fluid? In some cases, it's just going to be normal saline. In other cases, it's going to be 3% normal saline. So you might be thinking now, I thought normal saline was isotonic. What? What is she saying? Hypertonic, because NaCl at 0.9% is an isotonic solution. It is if your sodium levels are normal. Remember, tonicity is not so much a fixed state. It's a relative value based on what you're introducing the fluid into, if that makes sense. And I do have a whole post about tonicity. And I think if you go to my website, straightanursingstudent.com, and if you type in the search bar tonicity, it might come up. Um, maybe try also isotonic and see if, if it captures that on the search. But pretty sure tonicity will work. So if your sodium levels are normal, then normal saline is isotonic, okay? But if your sodium level is low, then the tonicity of plain good old-fashioned NS is going to be hypertonic for you in this moment at this time. So don't be surprised. However, if your patient is really symptomatic and has a lot of cerebral edema, you know, maybe they are severely, severely altered or comatose, you're going to skip going the gentle route of 0.9% NaCl and go right to 3% NaCl. Okay, now 3% NaCl. 3% normal saline, should scare the bajonkas out of you because it is a very high alert medication. So you're going to be extremely cautious and build in safety features in the, to the administration of the 3% normal saline. Why the big alert about this because if you correct sodium too quickly it's super dangerous for the patient if you've ever heard of locked in syndrome then you know what i'm talking about so correcting the sodium too quickly can cause locked in syndrome so don't do it and maybe we'll do a whole post about how that occurs um, but for this purpose, just know that you are going to run your 3% NACL at 30 to 50 mils an hour, never, never, ever, never, 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 ever faster than that. So with that said, what I do is if I've got 3% hanging, I will label my pump. 3% very clearly. I will label my lines 3% very clearly. And at the Y site, you know, where someone could come along and Y site something in, I tape it off. I don't want anybody Y siding anything in to my 3% line. And I don't want anyone flushing a bolus of anything in through that 3% line. So I'm going to label it. If 
it comes in a high alert bag. I'm going to leave it in that bag so that it can be hanging from the pump with that big red lettering on it that says high alert. So I'm going to do a few things to make sure that what I call idiot proofing your patient, which I know sounds derogatory to none of the nurses I work with are idiots, but it's just, I'm making my patient, my room, my situation set up so that anyone could walk in if they had to do something and know immediately what lines are safe to use right off the bat. So I have a whole post about that as well, if you're interested, I think. Yes, pretty darn sure I do. So anyway, in ACL, the takeaway, run it in at a slow rate, 30 to 50 mils per hour. It will be ordered for whatever rate they want. Idiot proof the heck out of that line, okay? And then you're going to be checking serum sodium levels very regularly around the clock. So probably every four to six hours, you'll be checking a sodium level and you will have to call the doc if it increases by more than whatever in that time period. I forget what it is, but you'll have parameters for that. So there's a certain rate at which you can safely increase someone's sodium level. And you will also be doing neuro exams every one to two hours. So again, run it slow. Don't bolus anything through that line, okay? And that's kind of the basic nursing care of a patient with hyponatremia. I would say you'd also probably want to get seizure precautions going on this patient, which basically is just getting those seizure pads from central supply and make sure suction works at your bedside, that you have all of your suction equipment there, that you've got oxygen, that, um, what else? Those would be the main safety things, I think, for someone with hyponatremia. And um, they may need, to, may need to be restrained, say they're awake, but they are out of it, like off the rails, which can happen. Um, these people are going to be, you know, huge fall risk. You want to keep them safe and in bed until they clear and can um, participate a little more effectively in their care. You want to make sure that, you know, so if someone starts vomiting, you want to get them on their side immediately and have the suction ready to go so that you can keep their airway clear. And as the sodium levels safely correct, you'll see your patient come around and be more uh, coherent and participating more and, and rocking their neuro exams. And you can see visibly the benefit of your great nursing care. Hopefully, their cerebral edema wasn't so prolonged or so severe that they caused anoxic brain injury, which can happen. So you want to take care of these patients. Start with mild correction if you can. If not, maybe treat them with just 0.9% or you might go straight to the 3%. I have seen some places do 6%. I've never personally given 6%. I'd be really nervous to do that, but um, because I've never done it, I don't really know the parameters and the procedure for doing that. I imagine it's also a very cautious endeavor as well. So, okay, um, that about wraps up hyponatremia. And I know sometimes you guys like to hear just like what's going on in my life right now. So I had kind of an interesting couple of days at work. Crazy busy, so busy. Day shift is whack, I'm telling you. I love it because I love having my normal sleep-wake pattern, and I love not feeling like I have to tiptoe around the room because I'm going to wake somebody up, and I love working in the light of day and being there when the medical team is there and all of that. I love day shift. Night shift has some really great benefits too. I do have a post about that <laughs> as well. I forget what it's called, but I bet if you put in the search bar day shift or night shift, it would come up and it's kind of a comparison about which one is right for you based on these kind of things that I've learned about both shifts because I worked both shifts. But anyway, day shift is just ridiculous sometimes and I think a lot of it is because the majority of your meds are given during the day. If you've got a daily med, it's at 9 o'clock in the morning and both of my patients had like 10 or 12 
nine o'clocks and they had feeding tubes and it just takes a while because technically you're supposed to give each med individually and flush in between you know you remember you remember that from nursing school right so it can take a really long time and then you've got you know the nurse practitioner coming around the doc coming around doing kind of pre-rounds and then you get orders based off that and then for real rounds with the whole huge team happens on our unit you know from like 10 to 11 depending on what side of the unit you're on and that's where this whole gaggle of people come gather outside your room and you have to present your patient give a brief why are they there what's happened in the last 24 hours anything significant and then we go through a whole bunch of core measure stuff like do they have a central line do they still need it do they have a foley do they still need it are they on their um anticoagulation vte prophylaxis are they on their gi prophylaxis if they're on a vent what vent day is it um, what are all their drips that they have running at what rate what's their pain score what's their plan of care what are your goals for the day? So all the stuff that you have to go through this whole spiel. And it's, you know, it's the charge nurse, it's the attending, it's dietary, physical therapy, respiratory therapy, social work. Who else is usually in on this? I, that's, oh, pharmacist. We have an ICU pharmacist. The, I tell you, I learn more from her daily than I do from anyone else. And one thing I learned from her this week, I should start writing this stuff down because they are gems of knowledge. She is so smart. Um, is that valproic acid can cause your ammonia levels to go up. So I had a patient this past couple of days who her ammonia level was fine and then it bumped up and I learned in rounds, oh, that was probably because of the valproic acid. So super interesting. So anyway, you have rounds and then you get a whole bunch of orders based off rounds. And then the doctor will probably come by later for a more in-depth look at the patient. So on pre-rounds, they might not necessarily come in and see the patient. They might, depends on how sick they are. After rounds, typically though, they'll come in and do a little bit of a more, um, a more in-depth look. And then you get more orders out of that. So you're constantly getting new orders all day. And um, most of the traveling happens on day shift. So if you have to go to CT scan or MRI or IR, it usually happens on day shift. I didn't have any meals, thank goodness, but you have to give your patient their meals and sometimes they need help eating. And, and then you've got PT coming by and social work coming by and case management coming by and all these people. And it's just really, really busy. So I felt like I was running my tuchus off until about 5 p.m., which is when I finally felt like, okay, I can get my room straight, I can get everything organized. and But that's when we grab our pump totals and do all of our I's and O's. And it just gets real busy again anyway. So I was having busy, busy, busy day the last couple of days. And um, so the first day of my two-day stretch was, it was busy, but it wasn't I don't know. I had a, like a five hour period where I only had one patient because I pushed a patient out, took him to the floor and then was waiting for my ER admit for hours, like five or six hours. I don't know what the holdup was. And I absolutely despise a late part of the day admit. It will just mess you up completely. If it's after five, we kind of have this, it's just a, we call it a tuck in. If they come in after five, you're tucking them in, which means we do all these things when the patient first gets there. We change them out of their ED gown into our gown, which has the snaps and is more accessible for everything that we need. We check their skin. We check a blood sugar, height, weight, temp, quick pain assessment, quick focused assessment, grab some vital signs, maybe get their fluids up. If they got, you know, if they're there for sepsis or something and they've got an antibiotic that needs to go up, obviously that's going to go up. But all the big things we don't do. After five, keep them alive and tuck them in. So if you get an admin after five, it's not too bad because you're not really expected to do that much. You just want to get them settled, get them stabilized if they're unstable, and that's it. If it's any time before that, it's kind of expected that you'll have a pretty good handle on the patient. Um, there's a lot of paperwork with an admission so if the admit comes 
anytime after three, it is going to mess you up for the rest of your shift. And that's just, and you're going to get out late. You're, you're getting out late. There's no way around it. So, um, I was really hoping that my admin from the ED would come up. You know, I sent my patient out. I was back to the unit by 930 or so after giving a report on the floor. And I thought, oh, great, he'll come up. We'll have all day to get him settled and get him dialed in and figure out what he's got going on. No, I don't know what they were doing down there. But they show up at like, oh, like 4, I think, maybe 345, 4. And he doesn't seem that sick, right? He's on a vent. Um, kind of like this acute respiratory failure thing on a vent, sad and great, um, blood gas is improving, vital signs look awesome, and he's, he kind of looks like he's waking up and getting agitated, he turns, um, colors, he turns this really dark color in his face, and it gets really tense, so I thought, oh, he's really anxious, let's give him a little bumpy bump of the Versed, because he was on Versed drip for agitation, and helped calmed him right down, right? So I think the respiratory therapist maybe was getting a blood gas, doing something. We were doing something unpleasant to this to this gentleman. And um, he vagals, right? Uh, down to maybe low 50s, nothing wacky, but it was a change, right? So we kind of hmm, got, got our interest up a little bit. And then it didn't happen again until... I turned him because I wanted to be the good nurse and I knew he'd probably been laying on his back down in the ER all day and I wanted to turn him. I also wanted to look at his skin on his back and make sure he was clear. So I have the lift team guy come in and help me and we turn him and I'm, you know, checking his back, kind of cleaning his skin a little bit and I'm starting to tuck the pillows in so we can lay on his side, and I asked the lift team guy, is he, is he turning red? And he said, oh yeah, he's red. So I said, okay, let's get him, let's get him back, let's sit him up. Let's... And I walked around the other side of the bed to give him another Versed bump, bitty bump, and he Brady's. And this time he doesn't stop in the low 50s. He goes all the way down to 30 something, at which point I call out, hey, I need a little help in here, which is ICU code for get in here now, please, I need a friend. And he stayed in the 30s. I pushed the code button and he went to zero. He went asystolic. So ran around the other side of the bed where I had just put my beautiful pillows and gotten him on his side. Had to yank the pillows out, got the lifting guy on his chest because he was the biggest guy in the room. He's going to do the best chest compressions. So he did a few chest compressions. Doctor ran in. We got the crash cart in. By the time the crash cart got there, the patient had returned to spontaneous circulation and was moving around and probably really mad. But anyway, that just messed up my whole... I had to do a ton of charting. Oh my gosh. So my whole day just went wonk after that. By the next day though, he wasn't doing that Brady thing anymore and I was able to turn him manually. Little baby turns, but still it was progress. Um, turned out he had some kind of seizure thing and so we loaded him up with a bunch of seizure meds and hopefully he's doing better. But anyway, so that was just kind of like a typical wonky day in the ICU. I haven't, I, uh, haven't had a patient code on me. You know what? I think that might have been the second time I've ever pushed the code button. Um, yeah, I think so. Good times. So anyway, um, usually it's somebody else's patient, but, um, that was my second time. I've been a nurse for six years. So there you have it. Um, okay. So I guess that will kind of wrap us up. Just wanted to share my, my busy couple of work days with you guys. I go back tomorrow for a couple more. And it should be more chill because it's the weekend and we don't do mega rounds on the weekend. And there's just not as many people and it's just, there's a better vibe. I miss having weekends off with my friends who aren't in nursing. But every now and then I don't like work in the weekend. It's a little more chill. I probably just completely jinxed myself. Um, okay, so I know a bunch of you are brand new and starting nursing school soon. Um, for most of you, you're probably starting in the fall. Some of you are still in it, going all the way year round. I, I, you know, my hat is off. Kudos to you guys. I went to a traditional um, university on a semester system where summers were free. I think I took a summer class once, but it was the most chill class I've ever taken. 
And I needed that summer break like you would not believe. I don't know if I could have kept up the pace that I set for myself if I didn't have that break. But if you're a year-rounder, my goodness, you deserve a hug. Okay, so give yourself a hug. Um, everybody else also deserves a hug because nursing school is crazy hard and really intense and busy. So I want to let you know that I have designed, if you don't already know, a nursing student planner just for nursing students. I know everybody, all you millennials, like to use your electronics to keep track of things, but I'm telling you, I don't think it's enough for nursing school. There's so many tasks and to-dos. It's not just a matter of here's my class times and my test dates on my phone. You've got to keep track of a million balls that you're juggling in the air to do things, assignments, quizzes, projects, um, just random tasks, clinical it's a lot. So I designed a planner for nursing students that is absolutely incredible. And I can say that because, well, because it is. It is incredible. Anyway, it is available at Etsy.com because I'm so crafty. I sell things on Etsy. <laughs> um, and it is at www.etsy.com slash straight A nursing. Etsy, if you're not familiar with it, is E-T-S-Y. So it's etsy.com slash straight A nursing. Check it out. I think it's like 15 bucks. And it's a PDF. So you get a PDF file that you can print at home. Or you can, I do not recommend taking it to Staples or any place. It's so expensive. They charge so much for color printing. It's highway robbery. Don't take it there. Um, send it to this online printer that I found. They're great. They're called Nine Cent Color Copies. They are fantastic. I send everybody that buys from me there. They will print it, bind it um, in this like coil, you know, like a coil binder, just like a little notebook, and mail it back to you. And I swear it's under $25 if their prices haven't gone up since I last ordered from them myself. So completely worth it. I took one in to Staples because I wanted like a prototype for myself when I first designed it. It was about $180 to have Staples print it. I am not kidding. It was ridiculous, but whatever. Lesson learned, right? So check it out. You'll love it. There's um, visuals so you can see what the pages look like. It's got It's like a weekly and monthly planner. So you can look at your whole month at a glance, which I have to do. So I know, okay, what tests do I have coming up? What big things do I have coming up? And then the weekly is like the nuts and bolts day to day. Let's get this done. And there's place for lists. So you can list what assignments are due, um, tasks that are due for school, tasks that are due for home. You can keep track of things like here's what I'm going to eat for the week or here's my workout schedule for the week or my study schedule for the week. You can... Um, there's little boxes to check off so that you can keep track of, okay, I'm drinking my water every day. Not too much. Don't get hyponatremia. I eat my fruits and veggies every day. And then there's a little orange box on each, each of those days so that you do something that brings you joy every day. This is the le big lesson I learned in nursing school. I did not have joy every day. And I got really burned out. And there's a whole thing that I write about on my blog about how nursing school really um, – really affected me in a, in a negative way. And that's one of the reasons why I try to help you guys so much. So there's a little box to check for something that brings you joy. Maybe it's just spending five minutes cuddling your cat. Maybe it's taking a bath and soaking in the tub. Maybe it's going for a run. Maybe it's watching um, a ridiculous TV show for 30 minutes, whatever it is. So, and then it's got the weekly and the monthly and a place to write goals. And it's just awesome. You're going to love it. It is rather girly. I know I keep meaning to make a more... A unisex version. Uh, I have not gotten around to it yet and I, I don't have a lot of guys that reach out. I have had a few have that have reached out to ask that but not enough that it's worth because it would take, oh my gosh, it would take so long. But someday I am going to have a more unisex version because I realize not all girls like things that are pink. That doesn't mean you, just because you're female you like pink. But the first, um, my first pass at it so to speak. I've been doing this for a few years. It's pretty colorful. I think you'll like it. If you don't like it, um, let me know. And if enough people want a more muted color palette, I'm on it. Okay.
get that at Etsy. And then if you are a new student or a struggling student, I invite you to go to Amazon.com and check out my book, Nursing School Thrive Guide. You can search on Amazon for that and you will see to your delight that it is a paperback. It is a Kindle book and it is an audiobook. So however you like to receive your reading, it's there. And it has a five-star rating on Amazon for a reason because it is also amazing and it has helped so many people and I would love for it to help you as well. And that's it. So thank you all for joining in today. Have a beautiful day and as usual, go do something that makes you happy right now if you're not already. Okay, bye. This podcast is a production of straightanursingstudent.com, copyright, Mo Media.